So with that, I'll open us in a quick word of prayer, uh, do some housekeeping, and then we will start talking about what it means to follow Jesus in a warming world. Yeah, Father God. Wow, yeah. Uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for grace and provision as we gather tonight virtually in person. Uh, again, here, I'm just in this upper room literally with these believers lord and we're gathered through technology with folks from all over the country all over the world and we're looking at your scripture yeah maybe that's my prayer tonight lord is that how amazing it is how much glory you get lord how glorious you are that only you can unite this many people through this many years and ages and times and seasons and backgrounds, Lord, all following Jesus. That whatever, whatever cultural, whatever political, whatever economic, whatever scientific, whatever differences and distinctions that the world might say are important, your son Jesus in an upper room, much like the one I'm sitting in, Pray a prayer of unity for his disciples and not just for his disciples, but those that would become believers through those disciples. And so here we are, 2000 years later, still following you, still seeking your wisdom, still asking together as brothers and sisters for your Holy Spirit and your wisdom to help us navigate this age as we await the fullness of the kingdom of God with the return of Jesus. Yeah, that's my prayer. Keep us united over these next five weeks. We do all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that. I, I really I don't know where that came from. Um, okay, so a few housekeeping things. Uh, we will meet each evening at this time. We'll always open in prayer. We'll always do open in scripture. And then the bulk of our time will be in those discussion groups live with me or in the breakout rooms. Uh, we will record this, though. It is being recorded. So when we come back from the breakout groups and we kind of have the debrief session, it'll be there. So if you need to miss a week or two or if something comes up, life, kids, job, the car broke down, that's okay. You'll get the email with the video. You have the discussion guide. Um, we do ask that you stay on mute uh, for those that are virtual just because we are recording. Um, until we do the debrief, I'll obviously invite folks off of mute when we kind of chat at the end of our time together to share what you all talked about. Uh, but please feel free to use that chat box. Um, Lindsay is there to help monitor that and make sure everything is taken care of. Um, so yeah, with that, what I want to do, uh, if we can advance our slide, Lindsay, uh, that'd be great, is get us kicked off. Um, we've already done the welcome. We've already talked. We've already prayed. Uh, I just ran down our agenda. We'll do some scripture and tool. You'll have time to discuss. We'll debrief, and then we will pray on the other side. So a lot of prayer, a lot of scripture, a lot of talking. Uh, that'll be the that'll be the agenda every week. Um, so with that, yeah, let's jump right in to be mindful of everyone's time. Let's get that next slide there for us. So what I'd love to do is start us in Luke 24. Um, and, and this week, we're really talking about new creation. And if you have the discussion guide, you have this in front of you, you see already um, that we're going to be talking, we're going to be coming out of the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John. And both Gospel accounts um, in these sections are talking about some incidents that happen with the disciples, the followers of Jesus after the resurrection. So Jesus comes, he has an earthly ministry for three years, he goes to the cross, he's resurrected, and there he's with his disciples again. And we get these first fruits of new creation. So what I'm going to do is read briefly from Luke 24 and John 20, and then we'll unpack it for a second and talk about the tool we have. So uh, if you meet me in Luke 24 and you go to verse 44, here's what you'll see. Uh, the resurrected Jesus is there. He's been in the upper room. He asked if they have anything here to eat. I love that little detail. Two verses before uh, they hand him a piece of broiled fish. So even the resurrected Jesus in his body is like, can we eat before we take care of the rest of this? Uh, but this is what it says in 44. Jesus said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me 
and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So there's Jesus. He's in his new creation body, his resurrection body. He's there. He opens up their minds so they can understand scripture. And he says that all of scripture, when he talks about the Torah, or when he talks about the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, he's talking about all of the Hebrew Bible. And he says, all of it is pointed to and focuses on him. And it says that the Christ will suffer, rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance of forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And so you see that in the loop. And then in John, in John's gospel, in, verse, in chapter 20, um, especially in verses 19 through 28, I won't pick up all of them, but just kind of right here where I've exerted a little bit of it. He's in the upper room. He's in his resurrected body. And I'm going to start in verse 27. The disciples are there. And Jesus says to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. A few verses earlier in verse 22, it says that uh, Jesus is there and Jesus says to his disciples, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So again, in both Luke and John, we see this talking about forgiveness. We see the resurrected Jesus there. In John, we get the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. We get Thomas touching his resurrected body where the scars are there and so Lindsay if we go to that next slide um, I, I think these two verses help us get ready with this big thought here that what Jesus wants us to know is that we are witnesses we are witnesses to these things that the good news points to Jesus the new creation and I, I really want to stop here and like hang out on this big thought for a second because it's important that Jesus lets his disciples know that they're witnesses. And it's important to know what they're witnesses to, the resurrection, right? And I think one of the things that sometimes happens uh, if we're not very familiar with the scripture and the story that scripture is telling is that we think the story is about becoming, you know, these spirits or these ghosts and that one day we're gonna be on these clouds and we're gonna play guitars and go somewhere else. But what, Jesus says, as we just kind of read in Luke and in John, uh, first of all, he's resurrected in a body and he's eating fish with his disciples and they can touch his hands, right? They, they can touch them. Uh, and, and there's some mystery around what that means. And we won't know the fullness of it until Jesus comes back. But it's important to know that even there with Thomas, I, I love this line, stop doubting and believe. He wants him to physically see that he is there, that I, you are, I am here with you and you are with me. And you're a witness to this. And, and this tool that we gave you in the discussion guide, I think helps us as we're looking through how do we follow Jesus in a warming world? Because as we're thinking through how to be witnesses and, and talk to folks in our church and our congregation, at conferences, our family members, uh, I think Jesus sets up the good model, right? He starts with scripture. He's in the upper room. He opens up their minds. He goes through scripture with them. Whatever we do as Jesus followers in this warming world has to start go through and end with Jesus. Because that's what he says. That's what he says about himself in scripture. So it has to start with scripture. Um, but, if, but if we don't understand the science or the solutions of what's going on in the climate crisis, then we run into trouble trying to make witnesses. We run into trouble trying to help people understand what's going on in our current context. And so with scripture and with, I love how Tom is kind of like, physically observes and touches, kind of has like a scientific method he touches and, and feels, there, there's a bit of that observation where Jesus doesn't ask his believers to ignore the reality of what's in front of them. He just points to a greater reality. He points to the truth, right? And so the scripture and science together give us that truth. Uh, scripture and, and understanding how society works and culture works, we see multiple times here in both these passages 
Jesus talks about having grace or forgiving folks, right? So that's where that scripture and when we're full of scripture and we understand scripture and we move in society and culture, we can have grace for folks and we can, we can release that grace that God gives us. But then that last piece, and this is important as well, is being influential, right? You are witnesses to these things. And later on, Jesus is going to send his disciples out. And even as we read in Luke, he's going to send them first to Jerusalem and then to all the nations. So there's a level of not just understanding and knowing the scripture, not just understanding your reality and what God's reality means for what we can observe, but also this idea of going out into society, into the culture and being a person of influence. And so this sweet spot graphic really helps us visualize some of those values. And so as we're working through this book over the next five weeks and why I I desperately wanted to start here is my heart and our heart at EEN and here at Grace is for at the end of this five weeks, you all to feel like you're in that sweet spot, right? That you understand the scripture and the story of scripture and what God is telling us through scripture about his love for creation and for us, um, that you understand, yes, maybe a little bit of science, a little bit of the solutions, uh, some things that, 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 that are meaningful and true. But uh, importantly, and what we'll get to at the end of our time together is, is how do we go out and be witnesses? How do we be witnesses in our congregation, in our communities? And so we'll start this evening with some of those very questions coming right out of the introduction in chapter one. If you're the note-taking type, and I know some of you are, I'm a note-taking type. Uh, three key points to kind of remember off on the left, and then one question to kind of launch you off into your discussion, and then we'll start with this discussion question here from folks in my room. Uh, but the three key points just to remember, Jesus in new creation forces us to reconsider the story of scripture and put him at the center. Uh, you'll know earlier in Luke 24, some of those followers are on the road to Emmaus and they're, they're confused. They don't understand. They thought Jesus was supposed to be the Messiah. They had understood the scripture they thought, but then again, Jesus breaking bread with people. He, he recapitulates the story of scripture and focuses it on himself. And it causes us as Jesus followers to reconsider. Uh, the second point there, Jesus encourages us to stop doubting and believe. And then finally, we are empowered with the Holy Spirit to go and be witnesses to those in society around us. So those are the three points. And then this question, as it's 715, and we'll have 30 minutes to start with this question and then the reflection questions from the book. Um, What does it mean to you to be a witness of new creation as a follower of Jesus in a warming world? I actually just read today, uh, so I'm in Georgia, and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution is our paper of record on the front page of the AJC. Yes, even here in the South in Georgia, was a report from uh, the AP that this was the second hottest summer on record. So again, I'm in Georgia, uh, the Bible Belt, Southern conservative state, and on the front page of our newspaper, confronted with the reality that this was the second, or the first, the second hottest year on record, in the hottest summer ever recorded. So what does it mean for us gathered here tonight on Zoom and in person to be witnesses of new creation as a follower of Jesus in this warming world? Um, All right, so as we're coming back, uh, what I'd love to do with the balance of our time is kind of debrief a little bit and hear from each other because we are all across the country, uh, folks that are believers with all types of backgrounds and and kind of hear and learn from one another. And so what I'm going to invite you to do is type into the chat um, some responses, and then we'll read some of them out, and then I'll invite some folks off of mute. But maybe this first question um, that you can put into the chat before we even get to the discussion questions is, um, what strikes you about the first chapter of this book or the introduction, as you all were talking in groups, um, what just really stood out to you tonight in the discussion? So maybe I'll ask that in the room and let someone respond and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of report it out for you all. Um, what, what struck you from the first night of discussion? So put it in the chat and we'll read it out of the chat. Someone from your group, what struck you from the first night of discussion? Anyone here with us tonight? What struck you tonight? Anything? Anyone? We had a word in our group tonight. I'll tell you what struck me. I got my notes here. Is that um, God has accounted for it, right? We spent a lot of time in our group tonight talking about 
accountability um, and what God's accounted for and what he invites us into doing as believers. Uh, let's see, we've got some folks from Canada, Common Struggles, Karen, oh, Common Struggles, Dean says Common Struggles struck them. Karen has the very beginning of the book where Kyle is stunned about his brother making the radical decision to be a vegetarian. We had that same insight. Someone in our room talked about the brother going to the Christian school and coming back a vegetarian and how is that even possible? Uh, so, that, and it's got the thumbs up in the chat. I love that. Thanks, Karen, for that. Maybe one or two more. Yeah, what stood out to you? Gary says, uh, to be a witness is to be a truth teller. We need to tell the truth about climate change. Oh, that's uh, That's good. Yeah, we had some discussion in our upper room about um, diversities of interpretation, but maybe more importantly, this question of how. Someone said, okay, it's great to tell the truth, but how, or how do we go about this in some of the partisanship in our congregation? Mary says, I thought it interesting about the election in Kyle's school. Uh, we also talked about some of that idea of if you're a Christian or evangelical, you vote this way, even if you're small children. Um, and then Robert put in here, stewardship applies to resources as well as money and time i don't know if y'all believe me or not but i'm telling you the holy spirit is moving across got right here you can't see my page but right at the top we talked about poor stewardship waste uh brian and my group we, we kind of opened up talking about poor stewardship and, and what that means um so with that i i want to turn and we can keep reading these out of the chat all night. There's so many great insights here. I'm trying to say them out loud so that they'll be in the recording for those later. Um, is maybe invite um, Jack. You, you talked about here to come off of mute from the discussion of the coal co culture, uh, how much it is a part of. Jack, maybe if you want to come off mute and share a little bit about you all's discussion, um, especially around around that point. Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Jack. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it, he described, you know, even, uh, you know, as he talked to the people in that community, how, you know, their, their parents and their grandparents were all coal miners and, you know, the, even the ministers understood how much it was uh, part of, you know, the, the people's, you know, basic how they grew up and how difficult it would be to to change that to you know you, uh, to you know so they couldn't just stop uh being part of coal production uh without and, and stay in that community yeah. so there had to be a lot more than just saying coal's bad let's move on yeah i, I love that Jack, because you're getting to that identity issue. And I think Sandra's comment gets to some of this. So Sandra, if you're comfortable, I'd love for you to come off of mute. So Sandra says in the chat, uh, I said in my group how stewardship is discussed in churches, but only money, time and talents are mentioned for stewardship. The environment is not mentioned when people talk about stewardship. And I think some of that comes down to maybe identity, but Sandra, tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that comment. I can't see all the galleries, so I don't know if Sandra is making a move to come off of mute or not. I was saying that when they mentioned stewardship, they were saying like to better use your time, to use your talents, to glorify God. And when it comes to the environment, they just don't see that you need to take care of the environment and the earth and the resources that you have now and not to waste food and things like that. Yeah, no, that's, I, I, I love that, Sandra. And the reason I, I, I wanted you to share more, because I think we kind of had a similar conversation in our room when we talked about, someone shared about um, this beautiful image of, for those of us that have children or grandchildren, when you see your children, you don't just see them as they are, but you see them as what they can become, their potential, and how oftentimes we don't see creation in its full potential, what it can be, what God sees for it. And our conversation in our room, uh, for those that have been with me in book club before, you know, uh, we, we kind of ended up in Romans 8. So I think it's worth just talking about Romans 18 through 21, if you're the note taking type, because it gets to what you're talking about, Sandra, and, and this idea of stewarding um, 
God's creation. So Paul, when he writes to the church in Rome uh, about future glory, says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation. Creation itself is waiting in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So even there, creation itself has a future hope. It's going to be freed from its bondage and its decay into a glorious freedom. So there's something about that idea of being good stewards around that. And so maybe we'll move to one or two more uh, comments in the chat box. But I, I want to ask this question about suffering. I, I think it's uh, question four in your discussion guide. Kyle has a reflection on James 2.17, and he talks about the Bible having a word for the kind of faith that sees the suffering of its neighbors and does nothing to respond yes. dead. In the face of our neighbor's suffering from the effects of climate change, how can we use the wisdom of James, the wisdom of God, to better understand how our faith calls us to respond? Did anyone have a conversation about suffering and how do we respond as witnesses to suffering? Anything in the chat you guys want to put? We'll reflect on that. Oh, only moment. in the chat? Only in the chat? Oh, no, no. Come on. Yeah, Andrew, please jump mm -hmm. in, my friend. Uh, well, um, the most impactful book I'm reading now is uh, called The Context of the Cross, and it's about the theology of the cross. This is a Lutheran um, Lutheran tradition idea. Uh, it was important to, to Luther, uh, but he talks about how Jesus um, entered our world and suffered with us. And we are called to do the same with the suffering world, with the world that is falling apart. And uh, that's not only, of course, with creation care, but uh, it's also with um, anybody who's hungry or diseased or uh, uh, any of the least of these. Um, so uh, just as uh, Jesus gave up his life for us, so we need to give up our lives for others. That's that's the suffering with others. Yeah, I love that. I just jotted that context of the cross, I think is what you said. If you'll type that in the chat so folks can look up that record and get that if they like. Our upper room discussion here also talked about the least of these. We kind of got to a conversation about um, Jesus when he talks about separating the sheep and the goats at the end of the age when, when he returns, that the dividing line, the, the thing that causes the division, how he will discern who is who is uh, when they cared for the least of these, right? That's when they cared for Jesus. And we spent some time talking about um, good fruit and bad fruit and good trees and bad trees in our room up here that um, it's not, and I love how uh, someone in my room here put it, James isn't talking about, am I going to get this correct here? It's not about salvation. It's not about works. It's not works for salvation. It's about, I can't love Jesus and not love Jesus's people. Uh, that's a direct quote from someone in my room. So I, I wrote that down in my notes. I, I can't love Jesus and not love Jesus's people. Uh, I love the remark I want to bring up there about about Genesis. It seems like a lot of Christians see the story in Genesis about dominion, not about stewardship. Yeah. And it, it, the thing that I immediately thought of is the sense of that when we think about the kings of Israel, the ones that were scripture reflected well upon yeah. were not the ones who dominated, they were yeah. the ones. Oh, man. So we're having a cross the country conversation. Someone in Georgia is responding to something in the chat from across the country about stewardship and dominion and how we sometimes read this, maybe overly read the story of Genesis about dominion instead of stewardship and focusing in on, on dominion and when the, whether it's in Chronicles or Kings, when the writers of scripture reflect on who's a good king and who wasn't a good king, oftentimes it comes to stewardship stewardship of the people and authentically, faithfully following scripture. Uh, that's good. Man, I, I got to let y'all go at eight. I mean, you're welcome to hang out with me. I'll be on Zoom, but I do have to let you go in a couple of minutes. I'll read uh, two more here. We got climate disaster survivors, our neighbors in need. Oh, man, there's a whole conversation about the Good Samaritan right, right there in that comment right there. I wish we had time to talk about the priest and the Levite walking to the other side of the road as they're on their way to do whatever it is they think God's called them to do. 
And there's the Samaritan that stops for the person in need. Climate disaster survivors or neighbors in need. That is a sermon I want to preach right now, but I can't. Um, lastly, Robert kind of says here, we are now God's stewards. We are indebted to God for all we have. A steward is not at liberty to use what is lodged in their hands as one pleases, but as one's master pleases. John Wesley, Sermon 51. Oh, good Wesley quote. quote. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole parable Jesus has about the faithful servant when the master has gone from the house and how the uh, servant mistreats the, the maid servants and the hand servants and gets drunk on the master's wine. And then the master comes back. Maybe we'll talk about that in a few weeks. Um, but with that, a, a couple of things of note, uh, and I'm going to get you out on time. I'm going to honor your time well. We will be back here next Thursday. On Tuesday, you will get an email with this recording. You'll get an uh, email about what we're talking about next week. Um, so you'll get an email on Tuesdays. We'll meet on Thursdays. If you can't join, that's fine. You're welcome to email me about it, but we'll always have the Zoom recording. If you're in person this week and you want to join via the Zoom link next week, that's great too. We'd love to have you on Zoom. We want you journeying with us. Um, the discount for the book is still applicable. It's 40% off and free shipping in the U.S. Sorry, friends in Canada. I cannot help you with that. Um, but uh, yes, that, that is free uh, uh, free shipping, 40% off. And we will gather next Thursday and read chapters two and three. I'm going to pray for us and then I'm going to release you because it's eight o'clock. Father God. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit resurrecting Jesus after he suffered for our sins, Lord. And we thank you that you didn't just leave us, that Jesus himself comes and says that I am with you even until the end of the age, that Jesus goes so that you can send the advocate, the Holy Spirit to empower us, to help us be the witnesses that you called us to be, to help us see those in need and those suffering, Lord. And maybe miraculously, maybe against human nature, to see in every image bearer the face of God, to see Jesus. Lord, so as we head into the rest of our day and the rest of our week, the rest of our time, as we prepare to regather next week, my prayer for these folks gathered in the upper room in the Zoom room with me is that when they look out on this warming world and they see suffering, they see opportunities to not just be the hands and feet of Jesus, but to be a cool bomb to Jesus in need, much like he said as a helping those the least in need, much like the great, uh, the, the good Samaritan story. Lord, that we not be so busy on the road to where we're going and where we're trying to get to, even if we think we're pleasing you, that we miss seeing the one in need, that we forget to stop, that we forget to sacrifice. Yeah, that's a prayer this week. Lord, give us eyes to see where there are those in need, those suffering, those that are feeling the effects of the climate crisis, and give us a heart to lament and move from lament to repentance and from repentance to action, not for salvation and works, but because the good fruit of a good tree is caring for those in need, Lord. And we do all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Week one's done. Thanks, guys, for joining us.